please place your right hand over your heart and join me in the pledge. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Good evening. My name is Eileen Hupp. I'm president and CEO of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. The chamber is hosting this series of candidates forums as a service to the community. In our mission as a catalyst for business growth, a convener of leaders and influencers, and champion for a strong community, the chamber believes in the importance of providing opportunities for our businesses and our residents to learn about the candidates in our local elections. Over the next month, the chamber is hosting or co-hosting seven candidates forums. A calendar has been placed on your chair and is also posted on the chamber's website. In addition, we'd like to take the opportunity while you're here this evening to invite you all to consider attending our annual legislative forum and luncheon, which will be on Monday, October 3rd. We are honored to have at our legislative forum again this year, our speakers will be Congressman Ted Liu, Senator Ben Allen, Assembly Member Al Moritsuchi, and our Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn. Ticket for the, tickets for this luncheon are available for purchase on the Chamber's website, and a flyer is also on your chair. The Chamber, as you know, is an independent nonprofit organization, and all businesses, regardless of your location, are invited to join our membership. We would like to thank the City of Rancho Palos Verdes for providing the Hess Park facility this evening and RPV TV for taping the forum. We also want to thank two of our chamber members who provided the cookies for us this evening, and that would be Lieb Cody and Company CPAs and RBC Wealth Management. I want to thank our outstanding team of chamber member volunteers who are here with us here with us this evening, running tech, collecting your questions, and timing the candidates. Another example of how our local businesses give back to the community, and we want to thank you, the community, for supporting our local businesses. Thanks also to you, the audience, for coming out tonight to hear from the candidates, and of course, thank you for silencing your cell phone. And finally, the biggest thank you of all to the candidates for stepping forward to run. It takes a lot of courage and commitment to run for local office, and the Chamber of Commerce wants to applaud you for your interest in serving our community. And with that, I would like to introduce our moderator for this evening. We are very honored to have the Honorable Jerry Dehovic with us this evening. Jerry was born in San Pedro and grew up in the Eastview section of Rancho Palos Verdes. He is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. Jerry currently is an owner, partner, and director of a large investment brokerage firm in Orange County, serving as its executive vice president, chief administrative officer, and chief compliance officer. So candidates will want to remember that on the timing issue. His expertise is in financial, regulatory, compliance, corporate governance, and employee-related matters. He has previously served as president of the Nautilus Homeowners Association and currently serves as president of Seaview Homeowners Association and is an active Neighborhood Watch block captain. And of course, as you all know, Jerry also served as vice chair of the RPV Finance Committee. In 2011, he was elected to the RPV City Council, where he served two terms from 2011 to 2019. And during his tenure on the council, he served as the mayor's pro tem three times and as the city's mayor twice in 2014 and 2019. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Jerry Dehovic. Thank you, Arnie. You are welcome. Thank you, Eileen, and, and I am embarrassed when she goes through that rendition there, but, but thank you for that. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. I see a lot of old friends and familiar faces in the crowd there, which is great, people I haven't seen for quite some time. Uh, thank you all for joining us here tonight, uh, another beautiful evening in Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, I'm sure you'll all agree we're all very blessed to call Rancho Palos Verdes home. This is a special night. This is the first RPV candidate forum in what is now an election and campaign season that is in full swing. As Eileen said, there'll be several additional candidate forums over the next several weeks, and I encourage you to participate in each of those. Thank you for coming out. Uh, 
As a reminder, there are three open seats in this coming up election, which is seven weeks from tomorrow. We have an extremely full agenda tonight and a fairly large number of candidates, but I would be remiss if I didn't uh, have a few thank yous also, obviously, to Eileen and the Chamber for working so hard to put this and multiple other forums together. She's got a lot on her plate, so thank you, Eileen. Give her a round of applause. She deserves that. I, too, would also like to thank all the volunteers that are helping us here tonight, our sponsors, our timekeepers, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, and the staff of the city of RPV working behind the scenes. But most of all, I, too, would like to thank the six candidates that are here before you. Serving on city council is indeed an honor and a privilege, and I know this firsthand, and I say it pretty much every time I speak. It's a very important position as the decisions that that body makes can affect the entire city and all of its residents and potentially the entire peninsula. It obviously affects our overall quality of life. It often affects our demeanors and our feeling of well-being. It affects the quality of the, our city infrastructure, our safety, our pocketbooks, including important items such as our taxes and property values, just to name a few. We are extremely fortunate to have had many excellent city council members serve our city over the last 50 years. And I'm sure as with these candidates, our shared goal for the, our shared goal for the future is to make our wonderful city even better. Finally, putting yourself out there in the public arena as a volunteer to serve our community in any capacity is a daunting, challenging, and time-consuming endeavor. Uh, it is something that should be commended and lauded by all. As such, before we begin, I'd like to ask you all to also give the candidates a round of applause. Make them feel good before we get started. All right, now it's time for rules. Mm -hmm. This forum is designed to hear directly from the candidates for the Rancho Palos Verde City Council. The time limits that will be adhered to in tonight's forum are as follows. Each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening and closing statement. Each candidate will also have one and a half minutes to answer a given question. They will see right in front of them a 15 second remaining warning. Once that 15 seconds, you see that, please button up your thoughts because I will cut you off when it gets to zero. Okay, just, just fair warning. Uh, questions will be taken in writing from the audience throughout the evening. There are probably 15 or 20 questions already in the pipeline here. Please feel free to ask a question. Please understand that in the hope of covering many different topics and as many questions uh, as possible, we may eliminate duplicative, uh, redundant, and multi-part questions. The order of answering questions this evening will rotate tonight. The initial order, as you see in front of you, was determined by random drawing earlier this evening. Rebuttals to candidate, candidate answers will not be permitted with the sole exception that I, as the moderator, reserve the right to allow a rebuttal if a candidate specifically quotes or calls out another candidate, or I believe in my sole, in my sole discretion that in the spirit of fairness, a rebuttal is warranted. Rebuttals will be limited to 45 seconds. As an FYI, this forum is being streamed live via Zoom for viewing purposes only. It is also being recorded by RPV TV for future broadcast and may also be viewed live on RPV TV's YouTube channel. Individuals are permitted to record this forum if, forum if you so wish. However, if you are recording, please do so without distract, distracting or obstructing the view of other participants or actually audience members, not participants. To allow the candidates sufficient time and as much time as possible to speak, we will be running straight through to 9 p.m. with no breaks. That said, if you need to take a break, please feel free to do so and do so quietly. This includes the candidates and you can time that. You've got, if you answer a question, you realize you'll have probably seven or eight minutes if you need to do whatever you need to do. So we appreciate your courtesy again in doing so quietly. This forum will be run in a polite, professional and respectful manner. Remember, these candidates are your neighbors who, are, by stepping forward as a candidate, have signaled their willingness to serve our community. We appreciate the audience's anticipated cooperation and adherence to maintaining a polite and respectful forum for all candidates. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Please give us your name and your opening statement, and we'll start with Michelle. Turn the thing on. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of 
of who I am, uh, what my issues are, and why you should vote for me for city council. Uh, my name is Michelle Carboni. I'm a first-generation Italian-American. Uh, my family, is, uh, we migrated here, immigrated here from um, uh, Naples. Uh, we're cheesemakers. We actually um, initially settled in Canton, Ohio. Um, I have basic, uh, grown up with basic values, uh, hard work, education, faith, uh, take care of your family and take care of your neighbors. In Canton, Ohio, I was uh, raised in a really ethnic neighborhood and we all took care of one another. Uh, 1985, I came out to California for school. I worked really hard, went to school, got some additional degrees. Um, found my husband, he was my scuba diver instructor and our first home was in Redondo. Um, Redondo is not sort of a neighborhood, it's kind of a destination city and um, my husband and I worked really, really hard to um, find a home in Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, we've been here 10 years, we're in Abalone Cove. In the last five years, Rancho PV has changed a lot. We first had some major uh, part one crimes in our little neighborhood, and then we had this influx of visitors, um, and we were very concerned. So as a representative of the HOA, um, as a board member, I would go to council meetings, I would go to the preserves, trying to get some answers and some solutions and found as I attended those sessions as far as some of the responses really didn't address the, um, the homeowner's needs. So what I bring to um, this position is I'm, I'm, I've been in management my whole career, budgets, FTEs, systems analysis, and I have this passion for RBV. I love this city um, and want to be able to actually not only help my neighbors in my neighborhood, but in all the neighbors in RPV. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, you can give her a round of applause on that opening. I failed to mention we also have a participant via Zoom, Kevin Yorman. Kevin, can you hear us okay? You're good to go? All right, please proceed. You have two minutes. Hi, everyone. My name's Kevin Yorman for City Council. Um, I've been a resident of RPV for 25 years. I was a managing partner of a law firm until I was 50 years old. Uh, I retired at that time, feeling that we had sufficient uh, funds to enjoy the rest of our life. And I decided to give back to the community at that time be by becoming a high school teacher, which I did for about 10 years. I also became a college counselor in those years and then a college instructor. And shortly after, three years after becoming a college instructor, um, my wife passed away and I fully retired from work at that time. Um, and in that period, I rejoined uh, city government. I was chairman of the open space uh, park uh, recreation and task force about 20 years ago. At that time, I had a full-time job, a fa young family. I was coaching sports, and I decided I did not have the time to devote to city government that I thought it would take, because when I do something, I do it with my whole spirit. Um, two years ago, I joined the Finance Committee. I've been doing that for two years. Um, I enjoy participating in our government, and I think I have a lot to offer uh, from my various experiences uh, in running a law firm, in coaching, in being a teacher, and I hope you vote for me. Your man for City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Paul. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Sayo, and I just want to do a quick introduction of myself. Um, my parents came here from South Korea, and they settled in Illinois. Uh, they made it out west because my dad had an opportunity to be an electrician in, uh, at Todd Shipyard in San Pedro, working on Navy ships. From, and, and because of that, I was born here. I went to school here. I'm local. And uh, one thing that they instilled in me when I was younger was community service. They, they emphasized that giving back was the most important thing that I could do. So I took that to heart. I went to West Point, graduated, and served in the U.S. Army. I left the Army uh, as a captain. And when I was leaving, I told myself that I would dedicate my life, the rest of my life, to public service because it was important. So based on that, I went to law school, became a DA, and now I'm, uh, I'm a deputy attorney general for the California Department of Justice. Now, the reason I'm running for a Rancho Palos Verde City Council is because I want to show our local families, our families here, that there's lead servant leaders who are willing to serve, uh, that they can trust them, 
and that they want to preserve and improve the quality of life here for all our families. So I think it's so important that we continue to do this, and that's why I'm running. And I hope that in the coming days I can run into you in the campaign trail, and uh, hopefully I can get your support, and I look forward to answering all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> David. Thank you, Jerry. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my other candidates up here, from Steve, who's currently serving on the Planning Commission, um, um, uh, Paul serving on the uh, Pacific Center Advisory Committee, uh, Kevin serving on the Finance Advisory Committee, my Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Barbara Ferraro, um, and, and Michelle for, for throwing your names out there in the hat. This is a hard thing to do, and I really appreciate uh, the community involvement we continue to get. So thank you all for, uh, for participating. Um, once again, I'm Dave Bradley. Um, I was born here in Los Angeles. My family moved here uh, to Rancho Palos Verdes in 1972. So I actually came to the city a year before it was born. I'm a local kid. I uh, went to school here in, Palos, in the PV UNSD um, elementary school, middle school, and graduated from Rolling Hills High School. Um, long history in the community. I'm uh, an aerospace engineer, program manager, uh, aerospace executive by trade. Um, I have a wife and two children. By the way, I proposed to my wife underwater at 60 feet um, while scuba diving. So uh, we do have a tie in there, Michelle. Um, long standing um, ties to the community. I was an Eagle Scout here within the peninsula. Um, I've served as a Rolling Hills Little League coach, an AYSO coach. Um, I served on the Finance Advisory Committee as well as the um, Planning Commission where I was chairman before being elected to City Council. So I have a long-standing uh, history in the community. I love Rancho Palos Verdes. I'm dedicated to helping fight for Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, local control is one of our existential threats that we need to continue to counter. I am con uh, continuing committed to pushing back on Sa Sacramento's overreach um, with uh, unfunded mandates that they're pushing down upon the, uh, upon the community. Thank you, David. Round of applause for David. Barbara. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Barbara Ferraro, Mayor Pro Tem of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. And the big question was, why do I want to continue doing this job? That's what everybody seems to ask. Because this is my home. See, when I was younger, my daddy was a preacher and we moved a lot. And we never seemed to stay in one place very long. And I moved here 46 years ago, and this is home. I, I felt like when I got here, I had fallen into paradise, and I want to help keep it that way. I believe it takes an exper experienced leadership for this job. I served on the Planning Commission for two years, and from 1995 until 2003, I served on the City Council during which time I was mayor pro tem and mayor. I also participated in the San Pedro Area Reuse Committee as vice chair because it was determining how surplus government property was going to be used and I felt like it was going to impact RPV. My husband and I have been host parents to many exchange students from France, Serbia, Japan, and Spain. We've raised our children here, and now we're raising grandchildren here. And my f whole family has volunteered in service on the peninsula. And I'm currently serving a three-year term on the council now. I'd appreciate your vote. And check out my website, votebarbaraferraro2022.com. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And finally, Steve. Thank you. My name is Steve Peristam. I thank you all for coming out tonight and for tuning in. I've lived in Rancho Palos Verdes for 38 years. I'm not local. I'm not from neighborhood communities nearby. I'm from Rancho Palos Verdes. I raised my three children here. They all attended K through 12, our public school system. I volunteered for my services to the city for the last 35 years. Our city's beauty is maintained in part by the 1989 View Ordinance. I was one of the authors of that ordinance. 
I've served on a residential standards committee that resulted in more flexible zoning standards for residents on smaller lots. I've served on the Rancho Palos Verdes Planning Commission for 11 years, two stints as chairman, which just rolled off that second stint over two different periods of time. So that spans of almost 20 years. There's no way you can be closer to addressing our quality of life related issues to land use than to be on the Planning Commission. For the past two and a half years, I've also been a member of a statewide organization, California Cities for Local Control, an organization whose mission is to help educate California elected officials to support the fight against Sacramento's efforts to take away local control over our zoning and housing development and to stop treating every one of our 525 cities the same. We're not the same. We know we're not the same. We're not all the same and we continue to fight to maintain our local control over these important issues and decisions. I hold two master's degrees, one in regional planning and another in public administration, and I began my professional career as a land use planner. I believe that I have the education, background, experience, and actively support of, to, uh, to, to the members of, uh, of the city council as well. And, and there's, um, look forward to the opportunity in the next two hours to explain to you my positions on the issues facing the city and to earn your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Great. Since we started with Michelle, Kevin, you'll be uh, the recipient of the first question here, and we, we don't throw out softballs here, so please pay attention to this question. Go ahead. What are your opinions on the remediation efforts at Portuguese Bend to slow the slide, and to what level are you willing to spend city funds to accomplish that goal? Um. The, the slide has been a problem ever since I've been in the city and ever since the city existed. We need to deal with it and we need to deal with it property, properly. Um, I've read and watched the council meetings concerning the slide issue. Some of the issues that are currently being discussed at remediation, uh, two of them trouble me and one I would like to see us do more. Uh, one suggestion is to do boring holes to understand the slide area more. I think this can be very dangerous to dig 80 feet deep into moving land for whoever goes down and could uh, greatly uh, subject the city to liability. The second issue is filling in the surface fissure cracks. I don't think we should be using anything in those uh, surface cracks that would harden. We should just fill them with dirt. If we put any material in them that hardens, um, some experts have told me that it could cause worse conditions by being a solid wall that will be moving rather than just cracks that'll be moving. The third issue that I see is keeping track of the landslide. The uh, proposal is to use LIDAR, which is like using drones and airplanes every once in a while. I don't understand why we're not researching using satellite technology, which would give us a flyover, I think about every 12 to 14 days and give us proper measurements on an ongoing Thank you. Day. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. I'm sorry, I should have given you a 15 second warning. My bad yeah. on that. I'll get you next time. Sorry about that. Paul. <laughs> I think the biggest thing that I keep on running into, especially with Portuguese Ben, is I keep on hearing the word can't from a lot of individuals. Can't do this, can't do that. And to me, it's disheartening because we have to come up with solutions. The biggest the issue that I think we have, because it's been a decades issue, is framing the issue. It's how are we looking at it? We have to tag it as a public safety issue because that specific road, PB Drive South, is an ingress and egress route. If that washes out or it collapses into the ocean, the people on the hill can't get off. So by framing it as a public safety issue, um, it frames it for the state as well as federal government. Now, um, one of the important things that we need to understand here is money. And we need to corral money, not only from our city, but from federal government as a state as well. Right now, as we stand, the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law that was just passed gives money to state governments. And I'm pretty sure these gentlemen here to my left know and understand that this money is coming from the federal government to do resiliency projects. It's called, it's called PROTECT. Now, if specific areas of land, i.e. landslides, uh, climate change washouts, things like that, are there, we can actually go in and ask the state for money, because that's where the federal government is giving it to, 
for these resiliency funds. Now that's gonna offset the solutions that we can come up with. So the most important part is making sure that we frame the issue correctly, saying that it's a public safety issue and corralling other resources, not just our city, but the other cities that contribute to the problem to tackle the issue and have a good messenger to do it with. Thank you. Thank you. David. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, it's a multi-phase problem. I mean, we need to continue to um, identify where the non-native water is coming from uh, and then turn off that spigot. We need to figure out how to get the water out of the slip plane. And once we do that, we need to figure out how to continue to keep the water out from getting in the slip plane. This is an issue that has been going on for years. We need to use the best science in the, uh, possible. There are ways to, to retard the, uh, the sl um, slide of the landslide, but we need to get after it and we need to get after it aggressively. We need to continue to work with federal, state, county, and local agencies for funding. Um, we have, as a city, already applied for several grants to help uh, mitigate those projects. In fact, this weekend I was talking to uh, or, uh, State Senator Ben Allen as well as Assemblyman uh, Al Marichucci um, about uh, them supporting Cal OES in uh, grant uh, submission for these problems. Um, this is a long-term uh, solution. It is going to take things that we've done before and look at the best ways to go forward, something that we totally need to get after. But this is not just a uh, RPV problem. It is a regional problem, and we need to be able to get funds from across the uh, continuum of governments. Thank you. Barbara. Okay, well, I agree with Kevin about not filling it with some substance like concrete. I do think we need to tr go with the dirt. Um, we are currently working on an EIR to be able to try some slant drilling because in the past, we've had previous uh, water extraction wells that have sheared off because as soon as they were bored, you know, the land moves and it took the wells with it. So we need to be able to get the water out. And if any of you have ever held or felt bentonite, you know, it's a rock. But as soon as you drip water onto it, it can get it just like soap. And so the whole idea is to figure out how we can get the water out and safely. And it is a public safety issue. And it's regional, because if that road gets taken out, that whole corridor from San Pedro around to the other side of the peninsula is gone. So we're hoping to move forward as fast as we can, get this EIR done, get help from the feds and the state. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Seems like we're continuing the same discussion uh, as we go down from person to person. So I'm, and, I, and I don't really disagree with any of those points. What I'd like to see, though, is something that we haven't done in the past, and that's what I'd like to see regardless of funding. I'd like to see the, 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 this project be implemented in phases because we have different weather cycles, wet winters, dry winters, and sometimes it takes a while before the water seems to permeate since we really don't know the sourcing of the water. So I'd like to see whatever we decide to do that we don't have a massive expenditure, and I'm talking about regardless of whose money it is, whether it's state money, federal money, or local money, or a combination of that, and then see what those results are, and have an estimate on what our expectations are. So if we slow the water down 20%, and we take some kind of a, a, an action on the first phase, and we get less than a result here, okay, then we go to the next one. Maybe we'll overperform. We just don't know. So I wanna not be patient, but I want to make sure that we have the ability to, if we get a result that we're unexpected, either good or bad, that we can make that adjustment to the next phase. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And Michelle. Yeah, Portuguese Ben, I totaled my car on that road, so it's, I haven't had a car since February. Um, Portuguese Ben slide, uh, 40 years, a million dollars a year. That EIR project to actually get a final draft on that. We've been working on that for almost three years. I, I don't disagree with any of the technical that's been brought forth. I think we need to make this a priority as far as trying to get a resolution to this. So 
however we approach it, we need to make it a priority to actually move forward, get the funds, and, and, and actually make some decisions as far as addressing that for the obvious reasons as far as the importance of that particular road. So um, it needs to be a priority. We need to approach it as a priority. We need to figure out how to prioritize getting some funds to actually fix it and find the best solution for that. Uh, we've, been, we've been at this a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, uh, sticking in the infrastructure category. How would you prioritize the city's different infrastructure and capital needs specifically, and what projects would you identify? Paul. I think the most important. Is your mic on? Okay, go ahead. Yes. I think the most important thing is, uh, especially for our community, is if you're going to make an investment, it's like any individual at a household, right? You're going to think about where you're going to spend the money, but when you invest in it, is it going to return a, a, a dividend, right? So it's an investment in the community. So when you look at these capital improvement projects, the most important thing is what is it going to provide the community given how much money we're going to spend? So specifically, there's a lot of issues, and I sit on Civic Center Advisory Committee. I think it's a very important project to have in the next coming years because right now, as it stands, the city hall is sitting on the World War II barracks, and we're living in World War II barracks. It's not ADA compliant, to my understanding, and I think it's about time that we invest in it. And I like to use the word invest because that's what we're doing when we're spending the money. So what I'd like to do going forward is when we look at these projects, see what the return is for the amount of money that we're actually putting into the, the, the actual activity and uh, the buildings themselves. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. David. So I think we just talked about one of the major capital improvement projects, and that has to be Portuguese Bend. It's one of the major things that we're going to have to spend money on in the next several years to stabilize that road and Portuguese Bend landslide. Some of our residents over there are seeing land movement of 13 to 18 inches a year. So Portuguese Bend absolutely has to be top on that list. Uh, following that, we need to continue to uh, maintain our roads within the city and our storm drains, two things that we've had um, issues with in the past, but we need to continue to do that. Um, then we need to continue with our neighborhood uh, community grant program, uh, which is uh, giving infrastructure or uh, capital improvement grants to our individual HOAs to help with beautification projects. Um, once again, this is kind of pushing things down to the lowest level. We've had some great success in being able to give neighborhood grants uh, for our different HOAs and homeowners associations from around the uh, peninsula to help beautification of their entryways and their signage. Uh, beyond that, we also need to continue with the beautification of our uh, major thoroughfares. Um, we recently embarked on uh, the Hawthorne uh, corridor improvement, and we put in native plants and low uh, drought tolerant uh, plants along there. We need to continue that throughout the city uh, to make this into the paradise or to show this as the paradise it really is. Thank you. Barbara. Okay, well, first of all, I, I agree that the landslide has got to be number one, and we need to get that going as soon as we can. Um, we do have a plan, really, on other roads, and that's called the Pavement Management Program, and it's kind of on a rotational system, and just they decide whether or not it needs total resurfacing or whether it can just um, have, have a surface redone. So um, also, someone mentioned to me tonight about the islands, the medians, and we're working through that. Um, it, when we first did the that corridor island up Hawthorne, I was kind of looking at that and thinking it was going to grow rocks, you know. But all of a sudden, the the native plants started taking hold, and it really looks great now. So that's that's another um, product. Um, project that we're working on slowly but surely we're going to get to all of the the medians in the city and also the the beautification program um, and we need to continue that with the homeowners associations thank you Steve thank you uh, the Portuguese Bend area is so big and so much more important than any other capital improvement program in this city. Everything else really pales to that. What's on the line here is not only Palos Verdes Drive South, it's a major sewer line which is next to it. 
And if something happens and that road collapses and that area collapses, we have a few days of a crisis on our hands. So plus the liability associated with that. So I'm going to put that in its own little category there, and then we can talk about the rest of the capital improvement programs. We have storm sewers that need on up upgrading and addressing selectively in city. We also happen to have a, a 10, uh, 1,000, 1,100 on-site septic systems in our city, which not many people know about. And we have a very slow-moving capital program that's identifying the location of those and about four steps to address that. But we need to take a look at that and see if there's opportunity to have uh, uh, lines that will give us the ability, in some cases, to just go a couple hundred feet and look and hook up to public sewers. And so that's something that really we haven't looked at, even though it is in our general plan. The rest of these projects are more, in my mind, maintenance projects. And I'm going to uh, support all of them in the, in the priorities that I just stated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Oh, thank you. Um, infrastructure projects. I think I go back to basics again. As everyone's mentioned, Portuguese Bend and that whole sewage uh, system that we have there that's impacting about 1,500 homes there. Our priority needs to be based on where our dollars are. Portuguese Bend infrastructure, sewers, roads, and the, the, the cost on the investment for added value, as mentioned, is secondary to the infrastructure that we need to sort of keep our city going. So my priority as far as the funding and where we need to spend our dollars um, and are those areas that impact all of the homeowners in that infrastructure component to it. So everything else is kind of secondary to that. So there's where my priorities are for Rancho PV. Thank you, and Kevin. And Kevin, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt you going forward and tell you 15 seconds, so, okay. okay thank you. Thank, thank you. you Chair. Um, the landslide is our primary issue that needs to get taken care of, and I'm glad I got to come back to this question. Um, we need to work closely with the Conservancy and Rolling Hills. Our landslide is being caused by underground water slipping through the land and causing the landslide. And those two uh, areas uh, are of prime importance in dealing with the problem. We also need to work with the federal and state governments in getting grants and money to help us pay for it, as well as Rolling Hills to help us pay for it. Um, the second thing that I would look at uh, is maintaining our roads, our sewers, uh, the beautification project. Uh, Barbara, I agree with you. At first, I was very skeptical about what was happening on Hawthorne Boulevard, but it's turned out so beautiful, and I'd like to see that on more of our roads. Um, the Civic Center. After the funding for Ladera Linda went through and we had to go in debt for the first time, I do not want to see us go in further debt for a new civic center that is largely repetitious of some of the things we have. I understand we need a new city hall. 15 that seconds. Should been, that should have been prioritized ahead of Ladera Linda. I believe we should use charitable funds, donations to raise the money to build a new civic center, not city funds. Thank you, Kevin. Next question, we are starting with David. What is your opinion on the apparent increase in homelessness in the city and how would you address it? Thank you, Jerry. Um, yes, we do have some homeless within the city. I think the last count we had was uh, six actually in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, unfortunately, we do have six homeless folks uh, within the city. We need to continue to help bring them services, um, whether that be down on the Western Avenue corridor uh, where we have uh, some of the homeless um, or whether that is folks that are being uh, pushed off of Metro at Golden Cove when the buses do the turnaround there. Um, unfortunately, when they do do the turnaround, they're clear of the buses, and sometimes the homeless are riding the buses, the Metro buses, to basically get out of the, um, out of the elements, and they get pushed out of the bus at Golden Cove. Uh, we've recently changed where that turnaround is and moved it up um, Hawthorne so they don't actually get off at Golden Cove and wander across the street on PV Drive South. Um, but we need to continue to make sure that we give them uh, services. We need to make sure that we address the causes of homelessness, whether it be um, financial, 
uh, whether it be mental illness or we need, or it be uh, substance abuse, or a combination of all three. Um, it is really a troubling issue throughout the South Bay and throughout Los Angeles County. Fortunately, it's not a large problem within our city. Thank you. Uh, before we move forward, just a, an announcement for the audience. I have about 25 or 30 questions here, so I'm filtering through those right now. So I'm, hopefully we cover your question if it does come up here. Anyway, Barbara, please. Okay, about the homeless issue. It, it's such a complex issue. And it seems to me like so many people in the state want to throw money at for housing. But until the causes, which I believe are basically addiction and mental health issues. I've had to deal with that in my own family. My daughter, my older daughter, who passed away in 2018, died homeless. She lived in Astoria, Oregon. She could have lived here in Rancho Palos Verdes. It was a choice she made. And she really, um, the addiction started when she was here at Rolling Hills High School with um, some drugs, but probably alcohol was the worst. And until you can somehow get people to address those issues, um, I also had a brother-in-law who was schizophrenic. And because the family took care of him and made sure he could um, have supervision, he was not on the streets, but he could have been. So I think it's very important to address these two causes of the homelessness. And we are fortunate we don't have a great deal of it here in our city. Thank right you, now. Barbara. Steve. Thank you. Um, I, I, I also think it's a complex problem. And it's also a complex problem when we have a, a grand total of six people in the census for our city. Clearly, we're not going to be the ones that solve this problem. And in that regard, we're fortunate. It is a broader problem. There is some, some impact on Western Avenue, slight, but there is some. But what we can do is we can follow the law. If there's a problem, we can report it. The, the police are, are, are very skilled at knowing the limits of what they can do to help people if they are in danger and escort them or ask them if they want to be escorted to a different location. And if, uh, if that's possible, they, they weigh in. If they don't, if it's something beyond, if a person refuses assistance, then really there's not a lot that can be done. We're fortunate, again, we don't have services throughout our city, so we, have, we, we don't have too many locations where, there's, where they're really a comfortable place to land on that. But I, I believe in, in a little broader sense that, uh, as, as Barbara said, there's components of this problem that, that are, are mental health related. I also believe there are economic problems as well, and that they're in, 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 in our society, in a, in a broader sense, we're going to have to deal with that before we're going to get the relief that we're looking for, with even if we have that number as low as six. Six is too many for our community, and whatever the South Bay number is, whatever the, the number is in the peninsula in total is also too many. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Uh, yeah, um, homelessness. Um, I think for Rancho PB, when I encounter them and I approach them to see how I can help, for as a as as a homeowner, I'm not sure who to call in our government here to sort of help. So when when I go past one every day when when I'm running, and approach and ask how I can help. So I think from a um, a, a city perspective, knowing the issue is very complex. What is our approach for Rancho PV when the homeless, we actually have them in our neighborhood as far as trying to approach and, apply and provide some services and trying to have some uniform uh, effort here that we have as, as homeowners that we could try to approach and help and see what services can be made available. I've not been successful on the homeless person that I try to assist. But again, it's trying to be collectively as a city to try to leverage whatever services we do have or whatever services are available so that we could potentially uh, uh, help um, those that actually are in our neighborhood and, and are homeless. So 
besides the complexity, what can we do as a city when they're actually in our neighborhood that allows us to provide or make available services to, to sort of help them even if there's only even the six that's there. So that's how I would approach it as far as trying to uh, do, do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin. Um, it hurts my heart when I see homeless people. Um, I don't see them. I don't think I've ever seen one in RPV. I'm told that there are, Dave confirmed six. Um, but I frequent Los Angeles a lot, and the growth of the tent cities has overwhelmed the city. When I first moved to L.A. 32 years ago, um, you had Skid Row with the boxes, and I think the tents are a giant upgrade from the boxes, and it, the city has gotten a lot better in cleaning the streets and providing them an area. But until we can provide shelters for all the homeless people we have, we really can't do anything about removing them from our streets. And as ever, ev everybody has said, we need to see how we can help them, how we can provide from them, what mental health, what health services do they need. Um, I haven't approached these people. I don't know if county services has. I don't know if we have any organization in the city that can approach them to see what they need on a monthly basis or a weekly basis to, just to check in with them and let them know somebody cares, because I think that's a huge difference, that there's somebody out there who cares about them. Um, I don't know if the shelters are finished by the Torrance Courthouse. I know they were starting to build shelters. 15 seconds. There those little tiny homes. So I don't know if we can offer any of our homeless people to move there, but we should try to see what we can do for them. Thank you. And Paul. Well, the first, the first step is treating them like human beings. That's the first step. And the second step is educating ourselves as city council members to actually know what's there to actually help them. The most important part is this, it, you know, Mayor Bradley mentioned that there were six. I'm familiar with three of them. It's not 60,000. There are three individuals to six individuals that we can actually help by educating ourselves as city council members to know which city services they can engage in and actually have them come out to do it. I think as city council members, we need to be a conduit, if so, and it, I know two of them are local for sure. We need to be educated in regards to what we can actually do for them. If we don't know, then our residents aren't going to know, and they're not going to know how to treat them as well or what kind of services they're going to need. So I think it behooves us to educate ourselves in exactly what we can do for them, uh, who's going to contact them, how do we follow up, and make sure that they get back on their feet. Now, for us, it's a... It's not a huge problem like LA City. It's not something that's unwieldy and that's not unmanageable with the individuals that we do have. We can treat them like human beings and have help come to them, contact them, do it early and often so that doesn't become an issue. Um, that's how I feel about that. Thank you. Thank you. And I've just consulted with Eileen. So candidates, we, we also want to test your ability to adapt on the fly. Uh, we, are, we are 55 minutes remaining before we must proceed to closing statements. We'd like to adjust the answer time period to one minute, so you need to be crisp. One minute, one minute, okay. So we, we've got so many good questions. Just, just get the meat of your answer out there, and, and we'll, it worked fine for the uh, school board. I'm sure you guys can do just as well. All right, so timekeepers, we're good. We're going to give them that 15 seconds at 45 seconds. Okay, great. And the next question, we're starting with Barbara. What is your biggest concern with the city's budget, and what would you do differently? One minute. One minute. Yeah. <laughs> Would you repeat the question, please? Sure. What is your biggest concern with the city's budget, and what would you do differently? I'm not sure I have a big concern about the city's budget. Okay. Um, one thing that I would like to see us prioritize is the, the medians and putting more funding into that, but we are fortunate that we have the income we have, first of all, from our property taxes, and then second of all, we're very fortunate that Terranea is in our uh, city, and we, um, they, they were not as impacted by the pandemic as we thought, so, I think we are on a solid footing with our budget, and I'm not sure we need to do a great deal more. Thank you. Steve. 
Thank you. I think we are, are in a good position right now as we speak in the last few years and weathered, uh, weathered the COVID experience. What I'd like to see, though, is since we are in a strong position, I'm, I'm one of these guys that's always worried, no matter how good things are and financially, personally, and, and, and otherwise. So I would like to explore if there's some mechanism we have to save more money and have a larger reserve, because we do know what's coming down the road. We know we have the slide area fix. We know we're going to have some kind of major expenditure in the Civic Center to replace the, the needs part of what, what uh, City Hall needs to look like. And we want to keep up our capital, uh, capital uh, projects as well. So I'd like to see you explore. And I know there may be legal limits to how much money we have in, 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 in terms of, of a reserve, but to, to explore that to see if we could save what we can save, because that opportunity won't always be with us. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. I've looked at our budget at death. Um, our revenues are decreasing. Our expenditures are increasing. Year to year, it's about a million dollars. That w There's a difference on that. What I would do for our budget, just based on my experience and my management skill set, is review every line item on our budget to see where we could actually make some cost-effective measures there and still have the, the value that we need um, from, our, from, our, from our city. So for me, from a budget perspective, is actually really high level and then detail as far as any potential cost savings that we could actually um, tease out of our, our current budgets with the revenues going down and expenditures going up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin. Um, our city is in great shape financially. I'm on the finance committee. We have budget surpluses. Uh, we have a general fund budget surplus of 28 million, 13 in reserves. 15 in excess that we can freely spend. We have a CIP budget surplus of approximately 14 million in excess from what we uh, are allowed to spend with 5 million in reserve. Um, our city's in great shape and I wanna see it stay that way. I don't want us to see, see us undertake large loans to build big projects. Um, one thing I would immediately do is appoint a special committee to fundraise to build special projects like Ladera Linda, like Civic Center. 15 when seconds. The school, when the school district needed a new swimming pool, they raised it privately. When they needed a new football stadium, they raised it through philanthropy and privately. When they needed a new baseball stadium, they did the same thing. We should do this with our big capital. Thank you, project. Kevin. Thank our you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Paul. Thank you. Uh, I did definitely review the budget, and one thing that I can tell you is the city is healthy, and going forward, I think we can do better, and the biggest concern for me is priority. Now, I actually do have a one-page document that is the budget itself for capital improvement projects. One thing that I want to do is change a priority, like, for instance, Portuguese Bend remediation is only, we only, we only spend $530,000 a year on that, and that's way down on the list in regards to priority because we have remediation for roadways and whatnot that costs $4 million. So in terms of priorities, you know, that's something that I'd like to definitely change um, the order of and how much we spend. Thank you. Thank you. And David. So our city is in financial, is in fantastic financial shape. Um, for the South Bay cities and cities in Southern California, we came out of the uh, pandemic in great shape. That's because of very conservative fiscal planning uh, by the, our finance department, as well as uh, planning for revenues coming back much slower than they actually did. Our partners at Terranea and TNGC um, have been great in, um, in uh, returning that revenue. Uh, we've um, budgeted very conservatively, and as we come out of the pandemic, uh, we're about to make a transfer into the general fund of about $1.3 million, which will be on the um, agenda tomorrow night's uh, council meeting. Um, I do want to say one thing is we did not go into debt for Ladera Linda. Um, we borrowed when we uh, could, not when we had to. So it was a financial plan, not a necessity. So we borrowed, but we didn't go into debt. So I think that's, that's a key portion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next question will be for Steve. What and where are your top traffic concerns in the city? Thank you. Top traffic concern is Western Avenue. We've worked a long time with trying to coordinate traffic flow with the city of Los Angeles under the directions of, of Caltrans, and we seem to not be very successful at doing that. 
uh, partially because, again, we don't control that. I think some of the other corridors are, are, are better managed. We're experiencing the, uh, the light and the implications of the light at the intersection of PV Drive South and PV Drive East. It's, uh, it's a little quirky. You can, you can see the impact that it's different, but I think we're still in that assessment zone. But Western Avenue is something else. And we're, we're going to have to go back again and see if we can get some cooperation with Caltrans to make that corridor flow, because right now it is just difficult, and particularly at the peak times of the kids going to school in the morning and with commutes, and in the same time in the afternoon with the kids coming out. It's, it's, Thank you. it's jamming up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, this is an area I don't have a lot of expertise in. I just think overall in general, we've got some major traffic issues here in, in Rancho PV and it needs to be looked at. So I don't have any definitive uh, area anywhere as far as that I would point out for this. Sorry, thanks. Thank you. Kevin. Um, I do like the addition of the few traffic lights that we've added to the city. I think it's uh, helped safety and safety and traffic is our number one concern. Uh, recently, I was coming out of Trump, and I hate making that left turn out of Trump against traffic. Um, I think we need a traffic light there. So that, that's one of the concerns I have. Otherwise, I'm willing to hear what people in the city want to have and what we need. I've heard some ideas about bicycles and cars cooperating more in our city because we have a lot of cyclists up here, and I'd like to see us coexist very happily so we can all enjoy our city. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Uh, my biggest concern is Western Avenue because uh, as of right now, I think a lot of folks that live on our side of the hill here, especially where we're debating or having the, the, the forum, a lot of folks don't understand that there's a development coming on the east side of Western that's going to cause a lot more cars to be uh, impacting Western Avenue. I think that's something that we need, definitely need to speak with LA City about and have a relationship with uh, that specific district in order that, so we can bridge the gap of what we want and what we want to see and to do everything that we can to mitigate any traffic issues that we may have in the future looking at this. And I think the leaders of this community, especially on the city council, need to have those relationships now, have those conversations now so that we don't have problems going down the road. Um, and I think that's the most important and pressing uh, traffic issue so far. Thank you. Thank you. David. Yeah, we need to continue to work on traffic calming on PV Drive East. Uh, so many uh, Saturdays, Sundays, you can look at PV Drive East and you'd think you, you were at Laguna Seca. Uh, we continue to work with the LA County Sheriff's Department for traffic calming up there. Uh, Western Avenue, a couple of my colleagues have uh, talked about Western Avenue. We need to continue to work with Caltrans and push back on some of their more ill-advised plans of trying to put in a bike lane in there by uh, narrowing the lanes from 12 feet to 11 feet, which is going to further further exacerbate uh, the traffic flow through the Western Avenue corridor, especially with Ponta Vista coming online, and in light of having to uh, implement uh, potential RENA numbers of putting more density in along Western Avenue. We also need to continue to work on Hawthorne, Al uh, Hawthorne Boulevard and the intersection with Fallon uh, coming down from uh, the park at the top. Um, as you come around there, it's almost a blind signal, and there have been uh, many close calls there, and we need to continue to work uh, with calming it there. Thank you. Barbara. Okay. Um, Western Avenue has been a problem. However, it's controlled by Caltrans. We are working with them. We're working with the um, representatives from the city of LA, from Councilman Buscaino's office, to see what we can do. Uh, and we don't really go along with that plan of putting in a great bike lane, narrowing those lanes, because the traffic has increased, and it, it's going to increase more with Ponte Vista coming online. But one of the things that worries me the most are some of the steep streets that we have, which includes the switchbacks on the east side and even the road right out here. So traffic calming is always a topic of discussion with the council. Okay. Thank you. The next question will be for Michelle, and this is, uh, I'm trying to break this down. It was a multi-part question with, with a bit of a premise. And it starts with, there is a concern about money taken for the election from contributions outside the city. Have you accepted funds from non-residents, and do you believe this appropriate? And that question is for Michelle. No, 
Oh, thank you. Uh, no, actually, I'm paying for everything myself as far as this campaign. Um, I have not um, actually taken any uh, monies from outside um, contrib contributors. And um, I think uh, I've, I've looked into this, and I would be concerned if a large amounts of money are going to a particular candidate on a, on a local a, a local council, so I, I would be concerned as to the the motive the motive behind this. But yes, I would be concerned. Thank you, Kevin. Can't hear you. Like Michelle, I have not raised a penny uh, for this election. The few dollars that I've spent, I've taken out of my own pocket. I real, you know, people have have offered me money, and I said no, thank you. And I frankly don't know what you would need large sums of money in this election for. I mean, how many signs do you need? And I don't believe in stuffing people's mailboxes and wasting resources with needless flyers or filling up their uh, voicemails with messages that nobody wants to hear. This is how we meet our citizens. Uh, we meet citizens through going door to door and uh, setting up tables in various places. Uh, I'm very skeptical about anybody 15 seconds from outside sources. I don't know what you would need it for unless unless maybe it's a family member who loves you. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, no, I'm not against it. And here's why, you know, some people aren't wealthy and some people don't have the money to finance their own campaigns. The other part is, you know, friends don't just live in RPV. Friends live everywhere. We have friends all across the country, and those individuals, if they want to support you as a candidate, I think that's very important. And I think it shows the dedication and the amount of energy and, uh, and just basically hard work in getting those funds to actually reach out to every single voter in RPV. You can't reach every single voter in this in time span. I've been basically walking for three and a half months, and hundreds of doors but it, we're not gonna get to 40,000 doors. It's just impossible. So in order for you to reach every single person in RPV, you gotta raise the money to get the mailers out, to get the, uh, the, uh, all the different social media touches in Instagram, TikTok, you name it, Facebook. You have to do that in order to make sure that your voters are informed about who's actually running. And I think it's very important. So you need the funds to do it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. David. So I don't believe in taking funds from outside of uh, the local community to run a campaign, certainly for city council. With the exception, I did receive a campaign donation from my father in Virginia. <laughs> um, but um, other than that, no, all of my campaign contributions have come from within the community, which I think is right. Um, it is a small community. It's a tight-knit community. I need, think that needs to be the source of your funding and the source of your support. Um, which all mine is from uh, local um, donations. Thank you, Barbara. Well, basically I am hopefully raising some funds for this because as I mentioned before, we're raising grandchildren now. So if you want to help my campaign, <laughs> please go to votebarbaraferraro2022.com. Um, so far, all of my contributions have come from the local area, but I do have to say I may get some from Virginia because my best friend from high school that I still keep in touch with said he would send me $100. Okay. So I may get $100 from Virginia. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a different approach to this. My, my campaign is funded by contributions from the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. That's what I'm about. And to me, that's another topic under the big umbrella of local control. When we talk about our community and local control, we're talking about the citizens of this community, the people that are out here right now, the people that are listening, and the people that we walk and talk to every day. That's the people we want contributions from. And I'm completely supportive of making this all about their voices being heard in, in this community because that's important to us. And it's okay. If anybody wants to do a different strategy, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that, but that's my strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. And on to the next question. We'll be starting with Kevin again. Do you support entertaining an increase in the city's transient occupancy tax? Not at this point. 
Um, one idea I've had for Ladera Linder, and I've suggested to the administration, and I know it's extremely costly, but who knows what federal and state funds you can get is building a bridge over the slide. Um, that's the only way I would increase their, their taxes uh, to help them pay for something that enormous. And I don't even know if that's realistic at all, but I think we should look into it. Thank you. Paul? No, I don't believe in it now. I, I, unless there's a specific purpose for it, I, I don't believe so. The city is healthy as of now, and there's no major projects that I've seen uh, that would be affected, so that's my answer. Great. Thank you. David? Uh, no, I wouldn't support increasing the TOT. The 10% TOT that we currently have uh, right now, um, I would uh, not want to see it increase. I think that would uh, uh, further retard um, <clears throat> our uh, local... Um, establishment's ability to come back out of COVID. I think we need to do whatever we can to help our businesses uh, post-COVID. 10% um, is really low. I do a lot of travel for business, but I think it's appropriate for uh, um, our city. And I think financially, we don't need to make a change. Thank you. Barbara? Well, I agree. I don't, I don't want to raise the TOT right now because um, Terranea has certainly supported our community, not just with the funds that come to us through the TOT, but they have participated in many activities in the, in the community. And right now, we're just glad that they have survived the pandemic and are getting back on their feet. And by doing that, they're helping the city stay on its feet. So I'm not in favor of uh, increasing the TOT, certainly not at this time, maybe not for a long while. And it is important that we support our businesses and keep them healthy. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? Thank you. No, I don't, I don't support a, an increase in uh, the TOT. The, the, the only thing I want to bring up here that may be a little different is that uh, it, Terranea is, is a motor, it is an engine, and it's very important to this community. And if we would consider any type of adjustment in the future, up or down, I would look into some kind of a relationship with Terranea to do a promotion of specific things in our city and maybe their investment in that same type of promotion where they would be mutual beneficiaries along with the city. So besides that, no, I'm not interested in adjusting the TOT, but just for future thought, if, uh, if anything, and under different circumstances, uh, I think there's some some discussion points that we can uh, we can have. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. No, I also do not support increases in the TOT. I again would look at our budget to see where we could reduce our expenditures um, for for the city, but they do not support an increase. In Thank the TOT. you. So we've got a little less than 35 minutes till closing statements. If everyone wants to stand up, if you'd like, for about 10 seconds and shake it out, get the blood moving. We don't need any blood clots here. Yeah. Candidates, it's you too. Just, just get it moving. We can hopefully get another six or seven questions, which would be great. So, go, Jerry, go. All right. Thank you. Okay, Thank sit you. Down. Seats, please, if we can. All right. Here's the next question. Again, there's a premise in this question. There appears to be little oversight of the sheriff station. And it's not me saying it, this is what the questioner is saying. Do you think this is an issue and do you have any suggestions for improvement? Yes, uh, I have a law enforcement background. I'm a prosecutor now and I know exactly how the sheriff's substations work. I've worked with them many, many times. I've had long conversations with Captain Powers. And one of the most important parts of uh, specifically that is having a relationship and having a conversation with them in regards to what we want. Now the sheriff's station, they are beholden to us. And the reason why is we contract with them. Yeah, we pay their bills. So in that sense, we need to make sure they understand what our wants and needs are, and we have a regular conversation about things that don't get done. So for me, when I'm knocking doors and talking to individual people, the biggest concern for them is that when they have calls, reports aren't taken. If reports aren't taken, it didn't happen. So Captain Powers is not able to see that, and he can't put resources to it. So the biggest problem is that I see is the communication. I think we can do a better job, as always, and make sure they understand our needs and wants going forward. Thanks. Thank you. David. I think we currently have a great relationship with uh, the Lameda Sheriff Station. Um, I currently sit on the uh, Public Safety Committee uh, with Councilman Alegria, who's in the audience. Uh, we monthly review the uh, overtime statistics for the Sheriff's Department, uh, what hours were spent, uh, what hours were requested. 
Um, it's a partnership with the sheriff's uh, substation there, or not substation, but station there. I think we continue to partner with them. We continue to work with them. There are staffing shortages within the entire Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Um, Lamita is one of the few that is almost near uh, staffing levels. We need to continue to work with them and continue to partner with our uh, our uh, partners in the sheriff's station uh, to improve or keep public safety a top priority within the city. Thank you. Barbara? Okay, we, we do have a really good re relationship with the Lomita Sheriff Station and with Captain Powers. He, he or a, a representative of the Sheriff Station always comes to our meetings. Uh, they attend the meetings with um, the mayor's breakfast with the other leaders of the committees and commissions in our city. And then our subcommittee meets with them. So um, I believe Captain Powers certainly is an individual that really cares about this community and does a good job of trying to address any issue that comes along. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I had the last, uh, during the last year, I had the opportunity as chair of the planning commission to sit on the mayor's breakfast. And every single month, Captain Powers had a current report to update the crime statistics for our, our city and to, in detail, explain almost every movement from month to month and what the, what the uh, sheriff's office was going to do to address that. I, I talked this poor guy's ear off on, on many of these uh, mayor's breakfasts because I was just in, in, impressed, really, on, on how, how close he was to minor changes in, in the data. Now, that doesn't uh, give him a pass going forward. If there's a problem, I think we have a very good dialogue to bring that up to him, and I believe that he will respond. But we are paying his bills, and I think we certainly have the opportunity and we have the uh, responsibility of, of uh, having these discussions. Thank, Thank you. you. Michelle. Yeah, um, it's with any of the services that we contract out, you have to have oversight and you have to monitor their performance and what they provide as service with some data. Um, bottom line, and so, you know, pers perspective or, you know, the, you know, how we approach this is how we monitor their service based on a contract. So I would say we'd have to look at the data to see if they're actually providing the service that we're actually paying for them. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin? You're on mute. Kevin, you're on mute. I keep doing that as I'm supposed to. That's but okay, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, public service is is a top priority for our city council and our city. And I think we've been doing a great job working with the sheriff's department. Um, I've met Powers, I've been at meetings with him, and I think he's doing a great job giving us the information that we need and staying on top of things. Perhaps one thing we can do if we don't already do it is set up some sort of phone center at City Hall to receive any complaints that the citizens may have about uh, the sheriff's department not responding as they want them to be, and we can take that up with Powers at the monthly meetings. So I think it's just maybe more communication, but I think I agree with everybody that they're doing a great job. Thank you. All right, the next question is for David, and it's somewhat of a segue. Do you support a safety center at the new Civic Center complex? Specifically, do you support adding a sheriff station, fire station, paramedics, et cetera? So I believe a uh, sheriff's department substation at the Civic Center would probably be underused. I've talked to uh, Captain Powers and leadership within the sheriff's department. Substations generally are not uh, used because they don't do their uh, roll calls there. They don't have the infrastructure there. They don't have holding cells there. And they don't generally have their um, uh, computer systems within the firewall. So um, unless we could overcome all of those, I would not support putting in a sheriff's substation there. Um, I do believe relocating one of the uh, fire stations uh, to the Civic Center, if we could figure out the traffic patterns coming out of the new Civic Center, uh, would bear study. Um, unfortunately, the egress out of the uh, new Civic Center could be challenging for uh, large vehicles, but that is something certainly that we need to address and put into the calculus. Thank you. Barbara? I don't think it's really necessary. Um, we have a good uh, center at the Lomita Sheriff Station, and 
as the mayor just said, they they have adequate facilities there, and I don't think that the fire station belongs there either, because the one on PV Drive South is a good location for going either direction, and if it's going to be problematic to get in and out of the Civic Center, then it the the emergency vehicles don't belong there. Steve, thank you, Barbara. Steve. Thank you. Uh, in both those cases, public safety, um, I, I agree with the, uh, the mayor and uh, uh, council member that if, if there was a need for this on the, their part, they would be coming to us. We wouldn't be trying to see if they were interested. And if we go back a couple of years on the bond issue that the county of Los Angeles did not pass, for fire uh, capital projects. I think that was a message that they're not interested in participating with us in any type of, particip of, of, any type of uh, facility in, uh, in C City Hall or the Civic Center. So um, I think we can safely, very safely say that they're not going to be part of our master plan for the Civic Center, whatever the rest of that plan may look like. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Kevin. It again. There you go. <laughs> I apologize and thank everybody for putting up with me doing this long distance. I'm in New York City for a, a family um, a memorial for my brother. Um, so I appreciate everybody putting up with this. Thank you. Um, the uh, I don't think we uh, need a police station in Rancho Palos Verdes, nor are they interested because they can't put a computer, they're not gonna put a computer station anywhere outside of there. That's something that they don't fully control. So if they can't have a computer, what's the use of uh, a substation at the Civic Center? Uh, the fire department, I don't think is interested either because as somebody mentioned the egress of getting out in that traffic. Um, 15 seconds. I think we do need some sort of new fire station on that side of the hill to house the bigger fire trucks. And I think that's a conversation we need to have with the fire department. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. I think the biggest issue is whether they're gonna pay for it. If they're gonna build it and, and actually put it in, I think I'd be advocating for it. Um, in regards to the sheriff's substation, if it gives us more presence and they're able to have those capabilities that uh, Mayor Bradley mentioned and things like that, I, I would advocate for if they actually paid for it. Same thing with the fire station. I think there's good addition to have that presence on the hill. And uh, if we, I don't know if you guys saw the, the fire station on PV Drive South, but it's not big. So if they can have new facilities that they can pay for and be co-located with us, I'd be for it. But if not, then I don't think it's a good idea for us to pay for it at least. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Did I skip you, Michelle? I'm so sorry, thank you. I checked you off in advance. I was getting ahead of myself, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of approach this kind of in a needs assessment and what our current services, if we have a gap and what we actually benefit from making these sort of decisions. So I'd have to go back to the analysis to see exactly um, where our gap is that would require us to add these additional facilities at the Civic Center. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else left out here? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think I'll so, think thank you. All right, next question is for Barbara. Uh, coyotes and peacocks, where do you stand? <laughs> where do you stand on each? <laughs> I don't stand on either of those two animals. Okay, well that's a good thing. Um, you know, peacocks are not native. However, they have become a symbol of PV. And they do add a lot of beauty. I know there are a lot of people that love them and there are a lot of people that don't love them and Sometimes it's hard to please everyone. Um, the coyotes, we do have a program of trapping, and I think they have eaten a lot of our small wildlife that we used to have. I mean, I don't even see dead skunks on the, on the highway anymore. Um, we try and get rid of them as we can, and all they have to do is call and request a trap at City Hall for the coyotes. Thank you. Steve? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the city struggled the last three to five years with, uh, with both these issues. And in both cases, I think they've done a good job of making progress in both education 
and for some behavioral change on the part of residents, particularly with coyotes I'll take first, and that is don't feed them. So they're naturally not going to come in onto our yards and attack our, our domestic pets if they're not drawn by food. And I think that we've done, done a pretty good job of educating the community. It doesn't stop. It's ongoing. We know where they live. They, uh, you can go on tour in the morning or in evenings and talk to them on a first-name basis uh, throughout the city and parks. And so that, that's just a, a fact of life. We have, to, we have to manage that. On the Peacock side of it, the city has had a program where there's a certain amount of, of relocation, and that number has gotten down to a pretty small number each year that's annually relocated. So I think it's Thank working. you, Thank Steve. You. Michelle. Um, the Coyote Management Plan for our PB. We've got a good plan on paper, and, and we've got a really nice app to kind of identify where these coyotes are. I have problem with the data and analyzing the data as far as the extent of the problem. That's where I have some concerns. We have this tier response chart and trying to get data as far as a trend or where we are, where we're going, so that we could actually identify some potential corrective action. For our budget, we have not increased our budget as far as the coyotes since it was initially put in. So I think we need to analyze better, identify the extent of the problem, and actually put some effective corrective action in for the coyotes is, 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 my, is my take on this. Um, for the peacocks, there, there is this relocation, and I realize that with the peacocks, it actually has been effective. Thank you. Kevin? Um, I have heard a lot of concern about the coyotes, uh, people who have lost pets, people who have lost pets in their yards right in front of them, not feeding them. So that is not the only issue. Um, I do believe the trapping program has helped. I haven't heard as much concern this past year as I did in previous years. I don't know if we have a program where we're tagging the coyotes and what that would cost, but that would give us a good sense of where they are and what they're doing if we, if we can tag them. Like I, I believe LA County tags the cougars uh, in the Santa Monica Mountains. On the coyotes, they are so beautiful. I had a coyote live on, I mean, uh, the peacocks. I had a peacock live on my house for about five years. And yeah, it's a mess. I mean, they poop all over the 15 place. seconds. Um, but, mm. but, but, you know, if anybody has a serious concern with them, maybe some of the peacocks in their area can be re relocated to other areas in the city so we all enjoy them. Thank you. Paul. Uh, I think the most important part is just educating uh, our RPV families and residents on the programs that we actually have, because we do have infrastructure in regards to trapping for coyotes and peacocks, and I think it's, it can be done. If they become a nuisance and they get identified uh, and they're bothering our neighbors and whatnot and eating rodents and small, uh, small pets and whatnot, I think educating them on the process of who to contact, where to go, those things exist. So I think it behooves the city council to make sure we push that out there so that we can utilize the programs we already have in place to fix the problem. Thanks. Thank you, and David. So we live in a semi-rural community. Um, I think that we have a, and need to continue to have our management plan for both coyotes as well as peafowl. Um, we do a annual census for the peafowl, uh, making sure that they have not overpopulated certain communities and certain neighborhoods, and we uh, trap and relocate when appropriate there. We also do a similar census for coyotes, and we uh, um, uh, trap them. Unfortunately, um, with the uh, laws within the current state of California, uh, you cannot re-release a coyote once it is trapped, so you have to euthanize that coyote. Uh, so, uh, Kevin, uh, to your idea, uh, tagging is not really um, a, a, a uh, option there. But I think both of those um, uh, management plans for both of those uh, species uh, within the rest of our semi-rural community I think is appropriate and continues to keep those populations um, at a manageable level. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Steve. Do you agree with the current policies of the LA County District Attorney and do you think it appropriate for the RPV City Council to opine either way? <laughs> what policies are we specifically talking about? Good well, push. if you look back, and I don't want to give you the historical, the, the city council was asked whether or not they wanted to support or, or not support the activities of the current L.A. County District Attorney. So I'm assuming that's what this is referring to. 
Give it a shot. That's okay. the question. Do you agree with the current policies? I'm assuming that means no bail and et cetera, et cetera. You know, I'm, I'm going to defer to the good judgment of the city council in the position that they've taken on this because this was in front of them and they were briefed with a, sta a staff report that advised them and they have, they are representative elected officials in this case. So I'll defer to their good judgment in this manner. Thank you. Okay. With that, Michelle. Well, I had a sign in my yard for a long time and collected signatures, so I actually don't agree with a lot of the policies um, that's currently with the district attorney and as part of the council would have made a decision in regards to that. Thank you. Kevin. You're muted. I've been asked this question uh, several times by, by citizens. Um, he was elected to four years. They had a recall campaign which failed. At this point, I think we give him his four years, and then we can see at the end of the four years what his policies have done. The bail system in this country has been a source of inequality on uh, both race and socioeconomic means, and that's a, di a discussion we can have at another time. Uh, but I'd like to see what his policies end up with after four years. Give the man a chance. He was elected. Uh, the people elected him, and he he deserves that chance. Thank you, Paul. Uh, in regards to the policies, the, the thing that I don't agree with is blanket policies. Every case is individual, uh, so everything should be looked at on a case by case basis. I think the most important thing is the question we should be asking it is, does it affect our community? My number one priority for us is for us to be safe to be safe from crime, to make sure that we have individuals uh, and our partners, i.e. the sheriffs, are doing their job so that our community members and our families are safe. That's the most important part, and I think that's what the city council should be, truthfully, that's what they should be concerned about, not you know, flagging something or stand, taking a position or something. It, it's focusing on the safety of our citizens. That's paramount. If we're not safe, then nobody's, nobody's gonna wanna live here anymore. So that's the most important question. I think I'll focus on that rather than anything else. Thanks. Thank you. David? Yeah, um, I agree with Kevin. I mean, the district attorney was elected uh, by the general population of Los Angeles County. Uh, he did survive a recall. Um, the policy are his policies. Um, but I don't believe in a one-size-fits-all uh, pushdown. I think we see some of that coming from, uh, some from Sacramento for um, local control. Um, as far as the district attorney's policies is, we need real solutions uh, to fight crime and to prevent repeat offenders. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we need to come together and find out what works. Uh, we need to make sure that our seats, streets are safe, our schools are safe, and our uh, communities are safe. Thank you. Barbara. Well, one of my major goals is keeping our community safe. And so as long as the district attorney is doing his job um, appropriately, um, I'm not going to try and recall him, but I certainly might not vote for him next time around. Thank you. Okay, next question. We'll begin with Michelle. This is a bit of a softball, but we're going to throw it out there anyway. What do you think is the single biggest challenge facing the city council during the next four years? Single biggest challenge. Single biggest challenge. Um, single biggest challenge. I, I think safety in the community is a, a big issue currently right now. Um, for that, I, I think the, well, single biggest, I guess, would be the Portuguese ban is the single biggest challenge as far as getting some traction on that and moving it forward based on some, some corrective action on that. Thank you. Kevin? The Portuguese landslide. It's not even close. Okay. Thank you. Paul? I would say the same issue as Portuguese ban and the landslide because to me, that's a public safety issue. Um, if, you know, everybody talks about that, it might slide into the, the ocean in 100 years. It could happen tomorrow. So we need to get the funds and we need to get the solution and the manpower and the resources in order to correct it so that we can figure out what we're going to do going forward. Uh, and I think 
we're in a prime window to get those grants from the federal government to build resiliency in our in our homes. And that's something that I want to do is make sure we look f to the future and start planning decades ahead and not election cycles, making sure that we focus on uh, just having the right messenger and the relationships in order to get those grants and pay down uh, or pay for the solutions that we have. We can't, we have to stop putting Band-Aids on the problems that we have and actually come to real solutions that can carry us into the next decades. Thanks. Thank you. David? So unfortunately, I don't think we can ever just focus on one um, item. I do believe Portuguese Bend is at the top of our list of things to focus on, but I believe we also have to focus, focus on crime suppression. We, also, we have to focus on local control. We have to focus on the finances of the city. Um, these are all things that are competing priorities, but we have to look at it holistically. Um, at the end of the day, the city council is not managing just one issue. It's managing a myriad of issues to make sure that our city is as prosperous and safe as possible. So I think uh, while several of these items that we've talked about tonight are major issues, we have to look at it in, in totality. Thank you. Barbara. Although I agree with we need to look at all those things, to me the, the overarching issue for RPV going forward is local control. Because we have Sacramento breathing down our necks with the one size fits all policy. And as some of you I know, um, know that 50 years ago, we all, almost 50 years ago, we were formed so that we could have local control, so that our representatives could adequately represent the residents and make decisions for the residents that are in their best interest. And every time we turn around, Sacramento is telling us how we have to do things. And I think that is the worst thing happening right now to Rancho Palos Verdes. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. I, I think we have a, a, a two-pronged problem here. One is the immediacy of the Portuguese Van Line slide, and we've spoken with that quite a bit tonight. The other is, as uh, the councilwoman just said and pointed out, is local control, because it's more of a insidious, slow deterioration in our quality of life. And so we have to fight both these. They're, bo they're both number ones, and they're very, very different. One's highly visible, one's very invisible, because we're gonna see incremental changes in our community if we don't push back against this. And, uh, and so we won't be having this discussion the exact same way of quality of life if we lose that second battle with, with local control. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question, we'll start with Kevin. There is clearly a trade-off between the quality of life of residents and public access to city parks and the preserve. What is your opinion on that? Well, I live on the preserve, it's my backyard. The steps the city have take, has taken over the last few years to restrict parking um, and have more control over access to the park has been fantastic. I don't wanna see that change. I don't wanna see it made easier. Um, I think it's working and I don't want us to tinker with, with it too much. Uh, one priority I would have is seeing the gate put back up. It was knocked down last year by an automobile, and I, I, I don't know why it's taking over a year to get it redone, but it should be done. It's a matter of security for the homeowners and for the preserve and for all of us so people aren't partying in the preserve uh, after hours and, uh, you know. 15 seconds. That may cause us a fire. So this is a very personal item for me, and the city council has done a great job at handling the preserve. Thank you. Paul. I think the most important thing is balancing the interests of the public versus the residents that actually live in and respect and their, what they want. The most important thing is listening first to exactly what the residents are saying. And then we also, as a city, have to be good stewards of the preserve. So we have to make sure that the access is there, but not at the expense of the residents. So we have to make sure that the city council does the balancing act that has so that the access is still available, but make sure that the residents are taken care of well. Um, and uh, I think if we continue with our program, we can always tweak it based on input that we receive. But I think listening to our residents is key to going forward and solving problems that they have with the preserve versus parking and, and access. Thanks. Thank you, David. So I think it's a continuation of uh, balancing the priorities. We need to continue to balance access with habitat, 
with um, uh, our residents. Um, we just recently were able to bring 96 acres into the reserve and put under conservation for into perpetuity, bringing the uh, Rancho Palos Verdes reserve up to roughly 1,500 acres, which is amazing for a city our side. Uh, but we need to, to continue to manage that and continue to provide uh, the, um, the support um, of that. Uh, so we need to balance the priorities between access for recreation uh, maintain the habitat as well as uh, being very um, aware of what our residents do. And I do agree with Kevin, we need to make sure that we get the Burma Road gate up and we need to keep the people from driving their Lamborghinis down Burma Road. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Yes. Well, one of the things that happened was with the pandemic and everything closed, suddenly we became the only game in town. And so, People went on the website and found trails, and it was sort of like Katie barred the door. And I knew as soon as Disneyland Universal Studios, op studios opened up, schools uh, started up again, because think about all the people that were coming here with kids. Now they have Little League and theater uh, and school activities. So the number of people that are coming here has dwindled almost back to the, the number before the pandemic. But we were able to get some management up near Kevin's house by implementing the parking, the special parking with, okay, she wants me to stop. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> okay. Steve. Great. Thank you. I agree with the, uh, the current council's approach to uh, the nature preserve. But what I'd like to see that's different that we haven't done, and that is a public safety and the fire danger in the preserve. We've talked for years, and there's been some efforts on the part of, of the city to get funding for undergrounding the utilities there. Well, I want to take a little different approach to that. I'd like to see a project put together that packages up and does the specification and scopes the project for that, for the undergrounding. And then we have something very, very definitive and defined in what we want to fund. And I think that will change the, the our ability to say that we need to do something to, okay, we have a project that's shovel ready and now we gotta go get funding for it. I think that that whole, that whole different shift there and do the front end work when we wanna get something done because it's in our best interest to lessen the risk of the preserve. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And finally, Michelle. Uh, one of the reasons I'm running for city council is the quality of life. I live in Abalone Cove, and it's not been managed appropriately based on the impact it's had on our neighborhood. So I would approach this as a balance based on controlling the visitors to our area, which brings in the crime, the traffic, just all the vandalism that also is impacting, um, you know, um, uh, the Trump trails and all of that. So I would approach this differently and say that it's not as balanced as it should be and that we should effectively sort of put in a different sort of process here to manage it much, much better to retain our quality of life, which has changed dramatically in the last five years. Thank you. Quick yes or no answer to this question. Although the city doesn't have much say with respect to bike lanes on Western Avenue, what is your opinion? And we'll start with Paul. Yeah, well, I, I guess I didn't phrase it. I'm trying to. I'm trying to read this. Do you support bike lanes on Western Avenue? I think it's a. Take your time. I think it's a nuanced question. I don't think it's a yes or no question. I think the okay. biggest concern is whether or not it, it impacts traffic. So if it impacts traffic, then I'm a no. But if it does not, and we do it correctly, then I'm for it. Okay. Thank you. David. So generally, no, I don't see the need for bike lanes on Western Avenue. I haven't seen a uh, compelling argument that they would be well used. I think traffic flow along uh, Western Avenue is paramount, and anything we do to impede traffic flow along Western Avenue is only going to go to the worst. So taking the lanes from uh, 12 feet down to 11 feet 
be able to have the width to put in a bike lane, I think is, um, is the wrong way to go. I see other bike lanes that Caltrans has put in, and I have never seen a bike riding down um, Anaheim Street next to re the refinery, yet we put in massive bike lanes there. So I love bike lanes where they're going to be used and where there's people riding their bikes. I have not seen the utilization on Western Avenue to justify uh, reducing the size of the streets. Perfect. Barbara? Basically the same. Um, they are, they're an impediment to traffic, and we're already trying to figure out how to traffic calm over there. And to me, just putting in the bike lanes and narrowing the, the car lanes down is going to create more problems than it's going to solve. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't see how we can safely for the riders at a bike lane on Western Avenue. If we're gonna take away a foot or two foot, we're going to condense traffic into a smaller area, and at the same time, we're gonna create a bike lane for the few number of brave souls that are gonna, gonna ride on Western Avenue. So I, I don't think that's trade-off. I don't, I don't see how we can make a, a real good uh, justification for the investment in that and actually make things- Please keep both. it down in the audience, I'm sorry. Continue, Steve. To make it both safe for pedestrians and bicyclists and car owners in that type of environment with a bike lane, I think will make matters worse and will be un less safe in Western Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah, again, evaluate based on traffic impact and also safety to the, the bicyclist. So I, I would say that whatever the data sort of shows one way or the other, but I would incline to say no. Okay, and Kevin. No, I don't think it's safe. And I think that the city can come up with alternative avenues for bicyclists to use to get to that part of the coast if they want to. We already have bike lanes all over the city and I don't see any reason to put it on that congested road. Great, thank you. And the next question, we'll start with David, and I'm gonna paraphrase this question, it's a long question here. Um, this probably will be the last question, we may get one more in, but anyway, with respect to unfunded housing mandates, do you believe the city should proactively oppose this fight using city dollars to lobby? Absolutely. Uh, we are actively pushing back on unfunded housing mandates uh, and an assault, um, almost a uh, quintessential assault on local control for the city. I completely support that policy. We need to be aggressive. Uh, we have uh, joined in a lawsuit uh, opposing the implementation of SB9. Um, I think we need to continue to use every method possible to push back on this upsurping of local control, pushing one size fits all housing into an area of very high fire danger, um, endangering our current and future residents um, in an unsafe manner. One size does not fit all. What may work in one community within California does not work in every community. We need to aggressively push back, and I absolutely agree with uh, using city funds to uh, push a lobbying effort in Sacramento. Thank you. Barbara? Ditto. You know, it, if you don't push back, then you're gonna get what they're going to send down to us. And right now, they basically are usurping the local control that cities should have. So yes, I'm in favor of using funds to push back because otherwise we keep letting them get away with it. And our city can't handle any more um, unfunded mandates. Great, thank you. Steve? More than any other issue, this is why I'm running for city council. This is my background. This is what I've been doing for the last two and a half years with a statewide organization to push back and educate other communities uh, against the, uh, the one size fits all. That's why I'm on the planning commission uh, still and why uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so personally involved in this because the state's approach to this over the last five years is wrong it will not address our affordable housing crisis. There's no nexus between taking away restrictions and limitations and management, responsible management for 525 different cities that are all different 
and saying one size fits all and we're gonna have the same rules as every other community in this state. Uh, it's just flawed. And we are, are going to push back and if I'm elected, I'll be part of that pushback and I'll have a, a louder voice than I have today as just the planning commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Yeah, I agree with everyone. I think in addition to whatever measures we can leverage to try to push back, but it's really important to get, to get homeowners informed and educated so that that effort is of all homeowners and the encroachment on our, our, our local control. So any measure we can do, but the more we can educate so that we can have homeowners actually uh, function as a, a core group here to push back. Thank you. Kevin? There are two issues here that people have been talking about. One is the housing element for low, low income, low cost housing, and the other is SB9. I think SB9 needs to be fought on all all cylinders. Um, it's come, we're trying to get an initiative together for 2024. I know Steve's very involved with that. And I think our city needs to be very involved with uh, repealing SB9 through an initiative process in 2024. On the housing element, it's a different story. Right now, we're just required to provide zoning where uh, low-income housing or low-cost housing can go. We don't have to build it. It would, from my understanding, it's cost prohibitive for any developer to develop that kind of property in Rancho Palos Verdes. Fifteen seconds. So I don't know if we need to focus our attention there as much as we do on SB nine. Thank you. And Paul. In regards to local control, I believe the elected officials of the city have the best pulse of the community and what their wants are. So I believe, and one thing I can tell you is that I'll do everything in my power to mitigate any detriment or any hurt or harm that might come to our, our community because of any mandates or anything that, uh, that may happen. Um, I do it for a living. I advocate based on my job for voices that are unheard or are small. And I'll amplify our voice if I'm on city council to make sure we push back on it and we ensure that there's no detriment to our community, to, to our quality of life. Thanks. Thank you. And this will be the final question and I truly want a yes or no because we need to move on to closing statements. Do you support the city going into debt and borrowing money to build the Civic Center? Just yes or no, don't couch it. And we will start with Barbara. I knew you were gonna say that. Yeah. Um, basically, no. Thank you. Steve. Basically, no. Okay, that's fair. Michelle. Uh, no. Thank you. Uh, Kevin. No, but encourage a committee to raise the funds philanthropically. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Paul. If we do it correctly, yes. All right. David. I don't support the city going into debt, but I don't equate uh, borrowing as necessarily going into debt. Okay. Thank you for that no answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> with, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will now move to closing statements, and we will start on the other end. Steve, you get the honors. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Two uh, minutes. How, how, two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you to the chamber for uh, for hosting this forum. This is this has been enlightening, uh, hopefully good for the public, and I hope for, from us a lot of fun. Uh, I've heard the candidates on a range of topics that are important to us, the residents of the city, and to the city's future. We as candidates are all public servants, service minded, running for office, or we wouldn't be here doing this in the first place. It's too much work. We weren't interested in doing this. So why vote for me in this election? And that's, that's really the key to this question. And my response is that experience matters. I have real positions on topics we've discussed, and I hope I made my positions clear. No sound bites, but thought through positions. I made some statements that I want to accomplish, and to some in cases, how the process should move forward. Some positions have evolved over time through uh, speaking with people, my background, experience, observation, and common sense. Others have really been a, 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 an experience that has evolved over time and circumstances have changed as well. I won't stop listening and I welcome the input because that's what enabled me to be here tonight to seek a seat on city council. So I respectfully ask you for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and give him a round of applause. Thank you. 
Michelle. Um, Actually, I'll take that. That's great. Barbara, go ahead. Thank you. You're, she's right. Go ahead. Michelle doesn't want to do it? No. She just okay, corrected so me. It's getting late. So. <laughs> All right. Two minutes, Barbara. All right. Two minutes. Well, as some of you know, I'm a teacher by profession. I've also worked in the federal courts of appeals before I moved here, and I processed prisoner petitions, writs of habeas corpus, civil rights, civil rights suits. I've taught Spanish in the district for 22 years, and I've been at Palos Verdes High School for the last 12 years. So I have a bachelor's degree in Spanish and political science. And now I'm finally using both of my, both my ma major and my minor. I've been president of my homeowners association. So while I've been serving on the city council, we've always had a balanced budget. We've increased the amount of open space in our nature preserve, and now maintain many trails and outdoor activities for our residents. My priorities include keeping the residents safe, from fires and crime, preserving the rural nature of our beautiful peninsula, and keeping our city in good financial position, and most of all, maintaining local control. So please check out my website at votebarbaraferraro2022.com. And I would very much like to continue serving this community for the next four years. And a big thank you to the chamber for having us here tonight and providing this for the residents of Rancho Palos Verdes. Thank you. <laughs> David. So first of all, I'd like to thank Eileen and the chamber for putting this on. I'd like to thank Jerry for officiating tonight. You've done a phenomenal job, Jerry. I'd like to thank the city staff for uh, the setup and the subsequent breakdown for tonight. Uh, this is all does not happen just uh, overnight. So thank you all for what for making this happen. Um, I'd also like to th thank the other candidates for tossing their, ra their hats in the ring. Uh, this is not something one does lightly, and this is hard to get up here and do this. So thank you all very much for being up here with me. Um, I, have a strong, I have strong local ties to the community and have lived in the community since its inception. Um, going back to the beginning, I really do have a love for Rancho Palos Verdes and a dedication to our city. Um, my campaign is uh, based on local support and not looking uh, or accepting support from outside our city. I believe this is a city election and, uh, and it should come from the city, within the city, uh, within the community for the support. Um, I have a history of collaboration and mutual respect on the city council. I wanna continue that. I think that we may not agree on everything, but we need to continue to collaborate and come together and come to common purpose. Because at the end of the day, we all love the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. I am dedicated to local control and pushing back on the existential threats um, and assault from Sacramento on our community and our city and our uh, semi-rural way of life. Um, I think this is one of the things that just cannot be overstated, um, what this could do to the city of Rancho Palos Verdes if some of these unfunded mandates continue to be pushed down and uh, local control, uh, local zoning, and local land use are taken away from the city council who knows best on how to manage our local um, our local land use issues. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I appreciate everybody from coming out and everybody out there in Zoom land for uh, dialing in. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Uh, I've been walking our neighborhoods for the past three months, three and a half months, and one thing that keeps on popping up from everybody's conversations is cell phone reception, that they're not getting it. And the second part is, then, you know, I can talk to you guys about afterwards, but the second part is, they want, uh, they say that they, it's time for fresh perspectives, fresh leadership, and fresh solutions that are problems that we're having, because we're dealing with problems that are for decades now. And that's something that they keep mentioning to me while I walk around. And my priority is preserving and improving our quality of life here. 
uh, in RPV. Um, I want to carry us in the future by bringing in high energy and hard work to the City Council to make sure that RPV is sustainable going forward and that we keep everything that we have intact, keep our local control, fight against it, fight zealously for it, and make sure that our, uh, our communities are not affected detrimentally by the decisions that are made outside of our community. Now, I want to bring leadership that you can trust. I want to bring leadership that will listen to you and leadership that will bring solutions to the problems that we currently have. Um, in closing, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to be able to speak in front of you today, and I hope I can uh, earn your support in the coming days. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chamber. Thank you, uh, Eileen and Anthony, for setting this Zoom up for me, which I think has gone uh, very smoothly, except for my problems with the mic button. And thank you, Jerry, for moderating. You've done a great job. Thank you, panel. Thank you, other candidates. I, I think our city has a, a great choice before them, and some of them, I think, are going to have a hard time making a decision. Um, I've been in the city for 25 years and in the South Bay for 32. I've raised my three boys here. I've coached an enormous amount of sports teams. I've been a teacher uh, of American history and American government, a lawyer and uh, a college counselor, and I've even volunteered as a judge. So I, I, I've seen lots of a variety of ways for me to participate in our community, and I care about people, I care about our community, and that's why I want your vote for city council. We have a lot of issues facing us in the near future, and I think it's gonna, we're gonna have to make hard decisions on what to do and where to spend our money. One we minute. Have, we have the landslide. Um, we want to preserve the beautiful uh, beauty and environment of our city. Um, I think we need to form a committee immediately. I've been pressing this issue. The Finance Committee unanimously supported it almost six months ago to form a committee to start fundraising and allowing people in our city to leave legacies, to name buildings, to name benches, so we can build these edifices that we want, like Ladera Linda and the Civic Center. And I think we need to move forward with that. Um, in terms of using our own money, we to use our own money, we have to use less than $2,000. So that's not a lot of money. You don't have to be rich to do that. And so far, I've spent 15 well seconds. So, so I think our, our elections need to be uh, looked after. And I'm going to give my full time to doing this job. I don't have another job. I don't have kids at home anymore. Thank you, Kevin. Good job. Thank Appreciate you, it. Thank you, Michelle. That was a little rough remote. Thank you for your patience and indulgence. Michelle. Uh, I want to thank everybody. This is the first time I've experienced something like this, and it wasn't so bad. So it, this turned <laughs> out really, really good. Um, I'm not on any committees. I'm not an incumbent. Um, I've been in RPV for 10 years. What I bring to this position is a fresh pair of eyes, a passion for RPV. Uh, my whole career has been management, management of budgets, data, system analysis, solutions, resources as far as what you need. So what I bring to the city council is a, a dedication full time to bring a fresh pair of eyes into our city. Uh, I wanna be able to go back to our original RPV, RPV goals and our quality of life and how, we, how do we actually go back and find that balance again, if, which is why I actually moved here. Uh, I would really appreciate if you would consider me as far as your vote for city council. I think I would do a tremendous job for you. Thank you. Thank you. And a big round of applause for all these candidates one more time. I just personally want to thank the audience here for coming out and spending a Monday night here. Uh, it shows that you care, and the candidates appreciate it, and I appreciate it. So, Eileen. I just want to say thank you again to the candidates, the audience, and mainly to Jerry Dehovic for giving us your time. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. I know the candidates will be outside to meet and greet all of you. Um, thank you so much for being with us this evening, and get home safely. Thank you.